Welcome back to the Nutramedical Report, and we have an amazing update report from Harley Schlanger's on the first hour on Wednesdays, the LaRouche Foundation. The reason why I line up as the LaRouche Foundation is I agree with 99% of what they uh, say and do, because they have a positive plan, they have a perspective with Linda LaRouche and his uh, team, they've been with them for decades, they have a, pro, a, a place that crosses the lines of what we call left-right paradigm, they deal with the most important thing, which is the population of the p- people of the planet, the re- preservation of the republic public the preservation of credit systems in the business and the pulling away of the final Jenga stick with Glass-Steagall of the global bankster uh, Sabatain Satanistic view that they think that all is for the bankers and withdrawing 20 to 30 years of the world GDP is a good idea while the world burns and population literally is not only going to austerity fascism but Agenda 21 population reduction and it's getting really bold where the globalists are now not only publishing in their reports which are not open, by the way, anymore for people's damned opinions. And I get really frustrated when people think they have a right to an opinion on something that's published. You just have to read. It's no longer an open point for discussion. We have to face the music, and then we have to plan and respond. In fact, only a minority of the population has to respond to turn this mess around. But we have to wake up now. And you have a remarkable speech you mentioned in Europe that makes this point very, very clearly. Harley, please tell us about it. Yeah, and, and last week's show we talked about the uh, Morgan Bank putting out in their own name a statement saying that the constitutions of Europe stand in the way of what's necessary to impose a banker's dictatorship, which of course is true. If you have governments that respond to the popular will, they're not going to kill off their people for in, to uh, protect a bunch of bankers. Uh, we also had the Bank for International Settlements saying that in order to protect the debt and the banking system, we need brutal austerity. Now we have something this week that builds on that drumbeat for mass murder. And this is something that appeared in, in yesterday's Corriere della Sera. It's one of the leading newspapers in Italy. This is their magazine section. It's an interview with a man named Jorgen Randers, R-A-N-D-E-R-S, who is one of the co-authors of the Limits to Growth report, this report in 1972, which really pushed environmentalism into a new phase, an anti-human, uh, save the planet by killing the humans uh, mentality. Now, Randers, here we are 40 years later, and what does he say? This is a quote from him. Democracy has failed in meeting the challenge of climate change, and authoritarian systems are needed. The best system I know to force citizens to accept the hard choice is the European Union Commission, an uh, elitocracy, that is elites, formed by very competent people, not controlled by the European Parliament or any national government. Uh, he says that... Uh, what, what they want is a 21st century feudal state of austerity fascism where we have serfs and there's no middle class. Well, and there's no government, there's no right to petition, there's no consent of the governed. It's consent of the elites. That's how policy is made. He goes on. It's even more explicit. He says that the European Commission has been effective in negotiations on climate change. Then he said the Monti government in Italy. Now, that's the technocratic government of the Goldman Sachs-appointed technocrat, Mario Monti, who was the first one to smash the social state in favor of European Union fascist austerity. He said, Monti's modern technocratic government is like ancient Rome, ruled in emergency situations by temporary dictatorships. Now then, Randers went on to say, young people must be willing and ready to do their part, which means to pay higher taxes and support a strong technocratic government which could act with long-term view. Lastly, they should make as few children as possible especially in industrialized countries. And then he praised Italy, because Italy now has the lowest birth rate in the world. And he said it's not because Italians are more demographically aware, but because in the last 20 years, you and Italy created a society that's made it totally impossible for a woman to have both a job and a child. And Italian women wisely are choosing a job. Now, Whoa. this is an open. If that isn't a slap in the face to the family, and, and the idea of 
Yeah. See, see, this is uh, this is basically the boot of of um, the Middle Ages and a feudal society uh, stomping on the neck of the Europeans, and they should smarten up. If they were armed to the teeth like Texans and Americans, this wouldn't be happening. Well, I got news for you, Dr. Deagle. It is happening in this country. We'll get to that in a moment, but let me just make a point. It's not going to happen. They'll go as far as they can, but I can tell you the revolt is happening in states like well, Montana we can, and we elsewhere. we can still beat it in the United States and Europe. Oh, yeah, we can beat it here, and it's going to be beaten, by the way. Even if it gets to be a hot, bloody revolution, they're not going to get away with this crap in America. Now, not. here's the point about this guy. He is one of the key people, along with Meadows and Forrester of MIT, who worked directly with Prince Philip and Prince Bernhard, the two founders of the World Wildlife Fund. Uh, this guy, Randers, was one of the deputy directors of the World Wildlife Fund. And this was a part of the Population Council, the group set up originally by John D. Rockefeller, Jr., for global population reduction, and then John, or John D. Rockefeller III. This is the highest levels of the oligarchy, the people who run the city of London, the people who are the interlocking board of directors for the major raw material cartels, including food, oil cartels, strategic metals, gold, and uh, financial and insurance. They're the ones who are dictating the policies to the European Union. And the fight in Europe is will governments that were elected go along with these policies or will they fight them? For the most part, even in places like Greece where the death rate is increasing, uh, in Greece, by the way, this is something that will mean something to you, the number of stillborn births is up 21% in the last two years, which means that pregnant women are not getting adequate care and their children are dying before birth because of the policies yeah. of the European Union as the banker's dictatorship. Yeah, wow. 21% increase in two years in stillborn deaths, a reduction of the birth rate, an increase in the death rate. Now, this is the policy that is behind the demands for austerity, which on the one hand is to defend the worthless valuations in the banks and prevent anyone from protesting the bailout or bail-in of the banks, at the same time, cutting living standards to the point that people start to die, including people who have jobs. We're not just talking about unemployed. There are 49% of the American uh, potential workforce, adult Americans who could work, only 49% have full-time jobs right now. That's the lowest level since, uh, I, I, since I started keeping records. Now, I heard an interesting comment that was analyzed by several different sources now, and I think it's probably correct, that uh, 30 years ago, when the Chinese were transferring technology to the Arab states with nuclear technology, including Saudi Arabia, with the assistance, by the way, of America through AQ Khan and Pakistan, etc., uh, paid for by the Saudis, which is now proliferated throughout the Middle East, to Iran and Saudi Arabia to a small extent, <clears throat> including technology they transferred so they can become autonomous nuclear states. Part of the deal was that we would uh, transfer industry to China, carte blanche, including technology and intellectual property, if they would stop selling this technology. I don't think that deal is holding it together. So right now we've been pulling in the last three or four years industry and sending it to India and Indonesia. When the Chinese are freaking out, which is why their economy is crashing, uh, the Chinese are getting much more aggressive in terms of the military policy, but it turns out this 30-year policy has deindustrialized the West. Rather than improving the industrial standards and the job outlook for people in China and reducing the amount of pollution and smokestacks, it's deindustrialized our country and put us in debt up to our eyeballs, including all these illegal wars. I can't blame Bad the Chinese news. for deindustrialization in the West. We've done it to ourselves. No, no, no. We, no, no, we did the deal that if they would stop selling nuclear materials, we'd let them give them all our industry. That's what I'm saying. Welcome back. And uh, the, if you wanted to say the Jenga stick that will pull apart Obama's bobblehead, 
and the globalist control freaks and the banksters are talking, pushing policies in Europe, which thinks it's a return to austerity, fascism, middle, middle uh, ages, feudalism, is a good idea for, uh, you know, no representative of the governed. This is obscenity in its most extreme form, uh, which the historical uh, precedent uh, since the sitting up of the British Parliament, going right back to the Magna Carta almost a thousand years ago, uh, this is pretty damn ridiculous. And I can tell you that the Europeans are going to revolt against it, and any kind of hegemony they have will be temporary. It'll be a matter of months or several years. And uh, Obama's attempt to try to put this kind of crap in step by step and creating a police state. The real issue is Jenga, is the Jenga stick, is the Glass Steagall. Once it's put in place and too big to fail, banks are gone. We're going to have a return to credit systems. We're going to have a return to business back to America. We'll have a return to the idea that maybe when students graduate, we won't saddle them with giant debts. We'll build infrastructure. We'll rebuild America. We'll rebuild jobs in this country. We'll build up other countries rather than tear our country down to, to quote, transfer business for the international banksters so, for the, so the elite can get even more powerful and more control. Because I think it's beyond just greed. These people are just damned evil. Um, and so, that's exactly the point. Let me give a, a uh, give the setting for what's happening this week in Washington. Uh, at the end of last week, a second glass steagall bill was introduced into the Senate. The first one was from Tom Harkin, which was very much uh, parallel to the House bill from Marcy Kaptur, which now has 70 co-sponsors. Uh, Harkin introduced a bill about four weeks ago, and then uh, last Thursday, a bill was uh, introduced by Elizabeth Warren, the, the freshman senator from Massachusetts, uh, John McCain, who hopefully uh, did it for the right reasons, but you never know in his case. Then Angus King, an independent new senator from Maine, and Maria Cantwell, the senator from Washington State, who introduced Glass-Steagall with McCain a couple of years ago when Obama and Geithner went in and crushed it. Now, as soon as that was introduced, the situation just exploded. I have a Google News alert whenever Glass-Steagall appears in the news, and it used to be five or ten a week. It got up to about 25 a week in the last few weeks. This week it's up to 500 citations, because what's Whoa. happening is the banking lobby, including a woman named Marianne Lake, who's the chief financial officer of J.P. Morgan Chase. She is everywhere in the news denouncing this bill. Now, there's a reason for it. And Tom Honig, the deputy, the number two man at the FDIC and the former chairman of the Kansas City Federal Reserve, who's a strong supporter of Glass-Steagall, because he understands, coming from Kansas City, the importance of machine tool production and agriculture for the economy. Honig came out and said all the arguments against Glass-Steagall are a fraud. <laughs> And he said what happened is the blurring of the distinction between investment and commercial banks allowed an explosion of speculative valuation, which could never be bailed out. And he said if the, the, uh, the, the people who support Dodd-Frank basically say they can handle the too big to fail banks uh, failing one at a time, that would never happen. We could have a situation where all the banks go at the same time. You could never bail it out. We need a firewall in place before that happens. Now, this is what you're talking about with the Jenga stick. If you get Glass-Steagall in, then by law, the Investment banks and the commercial banks will have to come before the regulators and show them what their assets are. And they're going to be asked questions like, how old are these assets? What is behind these assets? What is the leverage what, that you're using to borrow 30 to $40 for every dollar leverage? What are you holding as leverage? If it's a derivative or a swap, that leverage has to be written off. In other words, right. you're going to see a collapse well, it's a, of value it's a high risk. 30, 40, 50 percent overnight. That, right. And the reason is, why should we as taxpayers or as Americans have to pay the gambling losses of these speculators? Exactly. Uh, Simon Johnson, who's a very good author on financial matters, he's a professor said, if uh, you want to gamble and go to Las Vegas and you lose everything, that's your business. But I'm not going to give you the money to do it. 
But that's yeah. what happened with the banks. <laughs> well, you know what's interesting? It's like you got a psychopath on uh, on uh, on uh, crack cocaine going gambling uh, for a week steady without sleep. And we got to pay all the debts? I don't think so. And what's happening is these banks that are too big to fail are, are leveraging a highly speculative uh, gambling uh, instruments like derivatives. And then they want to hand off the debt. And they don't want to be honest about, in fact, the risk uh, to the entire banking structure by not walling off the well, regular they're, banking they're not, from the speculative all, banking. They're not transparent. No one knows. No. What exactly, they're using that's the point. for leverage because they don't exactly, have to show it. They can go exactly in that. and assert that they have a portfolio filled with credit default swaps, collateralized debt obligations. You have no idea, including exactly. some of the people who write them, have no idea what's in a collateralized debt obligation. They admit it. Right. But because someone else is willing to buy it and then sell it, take a bet that someone else will pay more for it, they keep leveraging it up. It, it's like a well, they also lie in there. exist at getting unlimited credit cards. You know, who well, the thing is, it's also, for it? it's almost like taking a credit card and running it up to the ceiling and then calling it an asset. They're literally calling exactly. debt an That's asset. exactly what it is. You know, it's, it's sort of like the problem with the way credit card companies work. If you're a, a responsible person and don't have any debt, they consider you a bad risk. But if you're someone who's got debt up to your ears and no income, they say, oh, here's someone who's been trusted to go into debt, so we'll give him more debt. We'll give him more credit. Exactly. And so, and of course, what happens is even worse. We, the public, become responsible, which means, in a sense, the international bankers are withdrawing the GDP of the world in advance of the world economy. So the next 20 to 30 years of the world economy has already been withdrawn by the banks. And it's the opposite of a credit system where right. you're taking on a liability, but you're using that liability to build something that will produce more wealth in two years, five years, ten years than you're taking on debt today to build it. So in a sense, right. the machine tools that are built today with credit will be paying dividends for years. And the, the idea that Alexander Hamilton had, never take on a debt without the means to extinguish it, or LaRouche puts it very simply. He said, we have to produce more than we consume. And a, yeah, I, a, well, exactly. a good farmer knows that. Well, the, one of the things that I've learned, a couple of principles. Number one, never pay interest, never touch your capital, always expand your credit where it's going to generate new income that will be an ongoing basis, which is basically a, in other words, a Hamiltonian credit idea. Uh, always develop assets that will increase in valuation if you continue to add value added into it, which means like when the Chinese had the recession hit in 2008, they put, I think, six or $700 billion worth into infrastructure, high-speed rail, exactly. transportation and systems, that's, that's electrical, etc. That's what we that's did what we used in the last do. depression. That's right. what new, we new, did new the robotic. Eisenhower Road Program in the 50s. New robotic factories, writing off the debt of students so that they can actually buy a home, buy a car, have a family. Uh, all of the things are the opposite of austerity fascism. Amazing. Evil Bastards Incorporated need to be stopped with the glass steagall Act. You've got some interesting comments to make here. Um, I'd like you to, com to to open up with the comments, firstly by Mr. Landers in Europe, and then expand to what Mr. The Abominator said. I, let's, it's a good term for him. Just like the Terminator, he terminates common sense. He terminates the idea that there's no that all Americans are American under the skin, whether or not their skin color, their religion, or their educational level, or their money. He um, terminates the idea of common sense, and the comments that he made to Africans are obscene in the most extreme. Can you tell us what Lander said first in Europe, to repeat it again, because that it's, first yeah. segment, that was so shocking. And then also, go on to Obama, which I think fits perfectly with the Henry Kissinger NSM document in 1974 that basically said, let's keep Africa a colony where we can extract resources and make sure we reduce the population. 
Well, see, NSSM 200, which was the then classified document that Kissinger had Nixon sign into law, uh, what it said is that we're threatened by population growth in underdeveloped countries. And the countries they named were countries like Egypt, India, Brazil, uh, Nigeria, African countries, many of which were beginning to have aspirations to become real modern economies. And Kissinger said, if necessary, we should use food as a weapon to force them to reduce their populations. Now, that came out just as the modern American environmentalist movement was taking shape. And I date this back to 1964 or 65 with Paul Ehrlich's book, The Population Bomb, which essentially said that uh, out of every three people, one of them is too many. And he just, he did this classic example of a computerized, an incompetent computerized evaluation using statistics to show that we're not going to have enough food to sustain the human population. Now, this is something that's as old as the hills. This goes back to Parson Malthus at the time of the American Revolution. But what right. happened is that then you had Meadows and Forrester, two MIT professors, extend this with their systems analysis to argue that the planet cannot sustain more than six billion people. Well, obviously, they've been proven wrong because we're sustaining more than six billion people. But at the same time, you had the World Wildlife Fund and others come out with these reports saying that we're going to destroy the Earth, the human beings will destroy the Earth. One of the people involved in that uh, study was a man named Randers. It's R-A-N-D-E-R-S. He's a co-author of the Limits to Growth Report. And at, at the beginning of the show, I read you these quotes. He said, democracy has failed in meeting the climate, the challenge of climate change. <clears throat> authoritarian systems are needed. And he said, the best system I know to force citizens to make the hard choices is the EU Commission. In other words, an unelected, undemocratic bureaucracy which dictates terms over and above national parliaments. Now, this is exactly the course that Obama took when he was in Africa. And I... I point out that when John F. Kennedy went to Africa in the late 50s, when he was still a candidate, he was still a U.S. Senator, but very much interested in kicking the British and the French and the Portuguese and the Dutch out of their colonies in Africa, Kennedy said it's the aspiration of young Africans to have an American-style standard of living, and that would be good for us. And that was the difference of the outlook of Americans in the 50s and 60s. Now, Obama went there last, what, two or three weeks ago and told African college students that while he understands that they'd like to have air conditioning, comfortable homes, and nice cars, if everyone in Africa had that, the planet would boil over. In other wow. words, our president told them, give up your dreams. You're going to have to live without air conditioning, without decent transportation or houses, because that's too much for the earth to handle. That's an incompetent no. scientific fraud. That is, is it ever evil, though? I mean, what well, a slap in the yeah, face. It's, to it's, the... it's a genocidal scientific fraud. Yeah, and it's a very evil comment for a for quote as he says, half black president to make to black people in Africa when they deserve to be able to live just as well as us. And again, as I've said before, peak oxygen, we can burn more uh, abiotic fuel. We can support a lot more population, but the energy flux density is we already have helium-3 tokamak fusion reactors. We already have energy from a vacuum. We already have literally limitless star power. You know, and Michio Kaku talks about level one, you control the power of a planet, which we do. Level two, you control the power of a star. Level three, you can have galactic power. Well, we're almost at the point of galactic power, which means you can also travel across the galaxy creating wormholes. We already have nuclear fusion reactors. So there's really no limit to energy. Once you have enough energy, whether it's food production, transportation, everything else is not a problem, especially if that energy source doesn't require using oxygen or interfering with the oxygen carbon cycle. And if you do produce some CO2, it's not a death gas from hell. You'd have the energy flux density to protect the Earth from near space objects. Not, not only that, the Earth but let me point out that CO2 is the fuel for photosynthesis for green plants. <laughs> no, and it's funny. If you want to moderate the climate, 
one of the things you want is more green plants, and you need CO2 for that. Right. So What's I, I obscene think the, about the, the whole thing? The point here is that we're dealing with a president who, who has no idea what he's talking about because he was chosen because of his color and because if he has a teleprompter, he sounds convincing. Now, the point is that everything he's pushing as U.S. policy is destroying the United States. It's destroying our industry. It's destroying our education. It's destroying our Congress. He's, he's violating the Constitution with his policies on Syria, his policy on spying, whatever, wherever you look, he's doing the anti-American policy. And anybody who challenges that is considered to be some kind of wacko conspiracy theorist or a racist. And what's needed now is for Americans who know something about these things to stand up and fight. Now, this week, because I, I wanted to bring, this, bring us back to this, because of the fact that we have a second Glass-Steagall bill, uh, the LaRouche PAC movement is sending our six policy committee members, the candidates from the last election, into Washington with delegations from Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, Pennsylvania, New Jersey, New York, Connecticut, to meet with congressional offices. We have over 60 meetings set up. Now, some of these congressmen are open. Some of them are idiots. But what we're seeing is a growing rebellion within the Congress because they know what you were saying earlier, that the American people have had it. And so yeah. by our forces going in and showing that the American people not only have had it, but they're coming to Washington to confront their elected officials, we have a shot at getting this Glass-Steagall bill through. Now, I, you know, to get it through by this week, it would be virtually impossible, but who knows? If we get enough pressure in Washington, we can change the situation because we now the, the momentum has shifted. Now, when people say Glass-Steagall wouldn't do anything, then why is J.P. Morgan so worried about it? Why is Lloyd Blankfein worried about it? Why do they have Obama twisting the arms of the Black Caucus? Because many of the Black Caucus members have signed up for Glass-Steagall. Obama met with them and told them, stick with my agenda. And afterwards, this was a closed-door meeting. Afterwards, they all came out and leaked that Obama threatened them. So yeah. he can't get his way anymore. His power is limited by the incompetence of his administration and the fact that he's an early lame duck. So we yeah. have an opportunity now that we haven't had in literally 13 years to have the people start shaping the agenda again and to get enough people in the Congress to say to them, stop worrying about parties. Let's unify the nation around a real solution. Yeah, amazing. Real solutions. That's what uh, Lou Rouge is all about. Amazing program today. Again, the number to call to get more involved is? 800-922-2907. And if you want to do something with your congressman, call us and find out what to say. 800-922-2907. Amazing. Posting up the links today, but the real uh, Jenga stick is uh, Glass Steagall. Uh, there's also some real good links if you go to LaRouchePAC.com, and of course, there's also the Executive Intelligence Review, LaRouchePUB.com. Um, the situation worldwide is critical. Uh, when they don't get their way, the globalists take us to war. They've tried their best, and in fact, uh, one of my heroes, and I want to actually order some hero t shirts of Mr. Vladimir who's now taking submarines <laughs> to the bottom of the Baltic Sea. I mean, this guy is like Rambo, only he actually has two clues, and he doesn't drink vodka, which is an amazing for Russian. And he's, uh, there's no way they're going to back the Russians into a corner. They're not going to back the Chinese. The Chinese actually have an ancient culture and have realized, no, we don't want to play this uh, globalist game where you bankers just strip our country dry. And, and print well, funny also, money and then own me, everything. Let me just add a couple points, because I've got to jump off in about two minutes. Uh, 
General Dempsey is the, the other hero, because General Dempsey has been saying over and over and over to Obama, you can't set up a no-fly zone in Syria. You can't ship arms to the rebels. There's no viable option. He's not doing it from a political standpoint. He's doing it from a competent military standpoint. He's seen our military be put through a meat grinder in Afghanistan and Iraq. And the effect of the loss of lives and the, the loss of health and well-being of tens of thousands of American men and women who have been damaged by those wars, for what? To, so that we then turn around and negotiate with the Taliban, which Obama is doing, to come back in Afghanistan? In Iraq, you have a government which is opposing U.S. policy. And, and I would hesitate, to, I don't hesitate to say that that's a good thing for them. So Dempsey has stood up against Obama. Now we've got people like Rand Paul and Mike Lee forming an alliance with Democrats Tom Udall and Senator Murphy from Connecticut against the shipment of arms to Syria. We have Democrats and Republicans coming together against the spying. It's a small group, but that's what the American people have to support. Uh, above party pro-american unifying policies to get our economy going again and that's what we're doing this week in washington and if someone wants to participate wants to be a part of that give me a call at 800-922-2907 and we'll we'll tell you what you can do yeah it really is uh, critical and the reason it's not just happening here it's happening all around the world if we don't do something about this almost immediately we're going to have a crisis of biblical proportions, literally. Because the banking system will collapse. And at that point, oh, yeah. and, if the only option is banker's dictatorship, you're going to starve to death. And what glass you know, here's the problem is, is an end to banker's dictatorship. The problem is, you see, that it may not be the bankers that pull the switch. It could be an airborne plague. It could be a natural disaster. It could be a coronal mass ejection. It doesn't matter. The gun is loaded. It's almost like... Uh, people are blindfolded and passing around a loaded gun with the safety off, and if they just happen to hit the wrong part of the trigger, someone's head's going to get blown off. So it's dangerous, and the situation now is critical, not just for Americans, but around the world. The globalists want us to go to war. They want economic devastation as a distraction while they but, but we kill off a lot of the to that, and, and I've got to jump off now because I've got a prior appointment, but I, I appreciate your support for Glass-Steagall, and I hope your listeners understand that we're not just talking about a competition between competing policies, we're talking about life-saving measures, and Glass-Steagall is the starting point of that. Yeah, it's the Jenga stick. If we get this in place here in America, also similar policies are happening elsewhere. By the way, the banking structure in Canada already has Glass-Steagall-like policies been in, which is why three of the ten largest banks in the world are Canadian, because they've had Glass-Steagall-like laws for decades and decades. They can't so get Dr. away with Deagle, this kind of crap. Dr. Deagle, I'll see you uh, next week. I, I've got to jump next off week. now. Yeah. Absolutely. Bye. I just want to continue this dialogue. And if you want to call in, 800 922 uh is the number to call. Uh, and, of course, uh, the, our number here at the studios is 800-259-5791. 800-259-5791 if you want to call in and talk about any geopolitical issues. Uh, in hour number two, we're going to be talking with Bruce on, in Hyperbaric Dives, uh, Campbell Kilgore and our latest advances in our new uh, Mountain Red Velvet DR, which will be launching very shortly. And we'll have Jonathan Rothschild talking about the ecological formulas. We haven't had him on in several months now. Coming up in hour three, we're going to do Open Lines, which is going to be really uh, awesome. We're going to cover a lot of news. I want to touch on the latest issue. Uh, the Robert uh, Zimmerman uh, said to the DOJ, this is, by the way, the brother of, of George Zimmerman, said, stop the witch hunt. Basically, what they're doing is they're tapping their phones. Uh, already, NBC is going to have a massive lawsuit. I watched Fox News last night, and Liz Wheel and another att female attorney was there. And let me tell you, these attorneys are smart. They know that NBC is toast. They're toast. Uh, what they did was doctor up the... Uh, the audio stream and actually edit it to the way that makes George Zimmerman look like a criminal uh, when he's absolutely not a racist. I mean, the man is Hispanic. He absolutely is not a racist. That's why one of the they have a black juror as well as five white juror females who review the evidence. And this guy was a gangbanger uh, that was literally scoping in people's windows. And by the way, when I watched the show last night um, on the O'Reilly Factor, he forgot to mention that slight detail. It's a very important damn one that. Uh, Trayvon Martin was scoping in the windows because he'd previously involved him in discharge from school because he was 
stealing. And he was scoping these homes because he's going to go in and steal things, break into people's homes. And, of course, being 6'2 and a football player, he was no, quote, child. This guy was fully capable of joining the Marines literally any day. Um, when you're banging someone's head against the ground, I know as a trauma doctor, you're killing somebody. If you get a fractured skull, even if it's not immediate, you get a delayed subdural hematoma, you're dead. Or you could cone your uh, frame and magnum as your brain swells just from brain edema. So this idea that he's going to do this and he's on top of somebody and he's not expecting that someone that could have a gun might put bullet holes in him is just plain stupid. It's not a racial issue. It's an issue where, as <clears throat> I, I saw the interviews, we need to deal with this issue of violence in America, which means we need to rebuild the family up. We need to make men responsible not having serial uh, families by not getting married and not having children and not being the same way with women. We need to make sure that sexual promiscuity is not acceptable um, uh, in or outside of marriage, that we need to start talking about the idea of the unwanted children. Abortion at this level is why, for example, family life, which is central to the Hispanic population, they're taking over the country with baby carriage, which is perfectly fine as far as I'm concerned because I think they deserve to. And even God honors the Muslim countries where if you're doing abortion or if you're mistreating the disabled, you get beheaded before Friday morning prayers if you're an abortionist. So, you know, uh, even religions such as Islam, which is pretty damned awful, respect the unborn and the disabled, God will honor that. And I think it's uh, obscene that our country spreads abortion around the world. And one of the first acts that Mr. Obama did was the Montreal Protocol, which basically means to prevent the usage of American taxes from even Christians to support abortions in Kenya, which is his home country. He doesn't even qualify to be an American or American president. And yet, and yet we think this, this is perfectly fine. It's not fine. And by the way, I think Obama... Uh, has already probably crossed the threshold of doing enough things in terms of supporting the Taliban and the Syrian Free Army, which is neither Syrian nor free. It's a bunch of thugs hired by Qatar or Saudi Arabia, many of them discharged from prisons with weapons, told that they're discharged and if they come, they'll, if they die, their family will get $100,000. But if they don't continue to fight against the Syrians and they try to return to the country, they'll go back into prison or be executed. So... We have a horrifying situation. Uh, we literally have a proxy war between Saudi Arabia and Iran. That's a real issue, which is between Shiite and Sunni. It started five years ago, even before the so-called social networking war with Facebook and Twitter that the West decided to get involved with on the Saudi side. They uh, picked bad allies because Mohammed Morsi wanted to put Sharia law in a country that's pretty secular and, and advanced. Egyptians are not Arabs. It's a very advanced culture, very intelligent people, and they didn't want a secular, didn't want the secular state to be swept away by Sharia law. Uh, it's a very large country, around 90 million people, and a very urban country, very advanced universities, very smart people. Why do they think they're going to get away with this stuff? So they had the head of the military, the head of the new Coptic Pope, the head of the Muslims, who wants to said moderate Islam is where it should should go. The same way we should have speakers in the Islamic movement here in America that want an American moderate Islam that doesn't teach Sharia law and doesn't force down the throats of Christians that they're infidels and doesn't believe and state make statements that Muhammad says that Jesus Christ will be his proxy killing Christians and Jews if we don't turn to Islam when the Mahdi returns. We've got to get with the program here. We're going to have a really, really big conflict in Obama. And the global bankers are riding on it. We come back, hour number two. You don't want to miss it. Bruce McKeeman, hyperbaric dives. I used mine this morning before I worked out in the gym, got my massage. It's amazing. Campbell Kilgore in our latest Mountain Red Velvet DR, our new stem cell building formula, and come launching shortly. And Jonathan Rothschild back. Hour three, open lines, 800 259 5791. 